Hello everyone, this is uh, Ramak Leroy from Dead Panic Studios. This is episode 102. Uh, we are going to cover concept art and animation for production. Uh, we have Jeff McLeary, uh, Jeff uh, Pauls right here. Sorry. <laughs> he is the uh, co-owner of uh, Dead Panic Studios. And we also have uh, Brad Grotman, who is the an animation director uh, for Dead Panic Studios. And... Um, we're going to start off with Jeff. I'm going to let him introduce himself, and then we're going to watch him paint something awesome. Go ahead, Jeff. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Pauzer. As Ron said, I'm the co-owner of the Pack Studios and the lead concept artist. So today, basically, what I'm going to be doing is taking this initial sketch, which is just the of this concept, and uh, fleshing out a, a full-scale body for it. Is that no, enough of an intro? <laughs> oh, yeah, Let's see you get to work, bro. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, so uh, everyone um, that is watching this, uh, you can ask questions at any time using the uh, the event page uh, with the Q&A app. But, yeah. So uh, you're going to be doing a full body, so uh, how do you usually start this? Uh, well, first thing, I'm just getting everything arranged so I have enough room to, like, if I want to... Because if, if the canvas, right, is is small or things aren't scaled properly, I don't have freedom to just, like, explore big shapes, you know, and move around the whole thing. Right. So I like to start with a, a really oversized canvas that I know obviously I'm going to scale down later, but just for the way I have to work so I don't feel restrained. So just get everything organized on the page, and now I'll actually start sketching things out. Yeah, I have like, I have like a, a very basic idea of what I want to do. So, but again, it's it's not too fleshed out in my head. So I'm just kind of literally just scribbling for super basic shapes and see if something stands out to me. Almost kind of like trying to find a happy accident. Scribbling, that's what I do. <laughs> right. <laughs> And I'm always, when, when I'm doing it, right, because it obviously looks like crap from a full 100% view. So what I do is keep my eye on the navigator almost exclusively while I'm sketching it because that's, that's what really, if it's working or not, because it's always important to look past the detail in these, this first stage. So I just keep my eye on the navigator and don't worry about how it looks up close because that, that uh, cleanup that can be done later time-consuming stuff, but it's not really that important. The important stuff is this first first stage. Nice. Make sure the silhouette is important. Yeah, that's a good tip. I like that one. Especially for you, Ron. Just mm -hmm. for you. Thank you. So what's this guy for? Well, this is the, um, the gum road that we're putting out. And I've heard of that. I've heard about that. Yeah. Exactly sure what that is, but sounds like it's going to be a good one. <laughs> That's what I heard. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be able to see you uh, sketch that uh, the beginning part up there up top. Or... What was that? In the gum road, we're going to um, see you uh, sketch that thing right there. No. No, this is the 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 first one I did that I didn't know I was supposed to be recording. <laughs> but <laughs> there's other other better stuff that I do have recorded, so don't worry about it. I got you. Nice. I was watching that today, as a matter of fact. Mm-hmm. I got a sneak preview. None of you guys saw it. It's just me. And was it super awesome? It was super awesome. That's what I was thinking. Made me go back and look at the stuff that I did and thought, my stuff doesn't seem quite as super awesome now that I've seen Jeff's stuff. So screw you, Jeff. Thanks a lot, pal. <laughs> that's that's what I aim for. Yeah, <laughs> sort of piss, uh, piss as long off. as it pisses off Brad, <laughs> my job's done. Yeah, yeah. But again, to those uh, that are watching, because um, we're getting a bunch of new viewers, uh, if you do have any questions that you want to ask uh, Jeff, or Brad, um, or in general just about the CG and the business, just um, go ahead and use a Q&A or uh, put it in the comments and um, we'll ask your question.
And again, this is um, Jeff Paulsrod. He's co-owner of Defang Studios, and he's going through um, a loose sketch phase uh, for this character called the Wretch that um, that uh, we're putting together for Gumroad for all of you. And um, we're just uh, we're just watching him work. I like the long the long arm idea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I definitely had in mind. I was thinking about what direction to take this guy in. Um, I'm not sure though if I want to do more of like a, a thin sort of agile, fast sort of thing, or like something I'll do right here real quick is maybe like really beefy. What what do you think, Ron? I'll I'll treat you as like a art director for this one. I'll let you decide oh, yeah. the direction. <laughs> so you want something like like this, or you well, want more of that? Let's see first, man. Let's see that shot. You're not done yet. Look, I got to go to lunch. So, um, you're fired. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Did I do it right? Did I do it right? That is a pretty good art director. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the impression is uncanny. Yeah. I like the retchy version. Yeah. <laughs> can you make it 80% retchier? <laughs> yeah, I can. 80% more rich. More rich. Tone rich, but turn up the rich. Okay. Yeah, the um, the thin version was was nice. All right, we'll go with that. Yeah, I'm I'm cool with this. Instead of wasting time sketching, I'll just start getting into a little more detail with this guy. I think because with, yeah, with, with the compact face and snout, if it was a huge body, the head might look almost comically small. But if we have a yeah. elongated, thin thing, then the head seems to fit with that. Yeah. Basically, now what I'm doing is just kind of washing away all the darks while still keeping the, the overall shape. Because then uh, if you start too dark, you have no, no way to add any clear separation. You know what I mean? So I'll, I'll go back in and kind of just, just re-sketch it like I would in, like it was just pencil or something. Nice. So separate out all the forms and stuff. So what type of things uh, are you looking for in, uh, in a concept artist to, to either... Um, bring on a project or to start teaching? Um, yeah, well, I mean, skill, obviously, but um, I think maybe even more important than that is the the dedication to it. Like, what what impresses me the most is not who is just really good right away, but the people who, who weren't good, and I've seen their progression. I've seen... Um, you know, posting stuff every day, and I know that they're working hard every day, and I can start to see a noticeable improvement. Because that, what that tells me, right, is that even when they get good, they're not going to just lose that, that drop. I've, if anything, they're just going to get more hungry to get even better. And that, I think, is, you know, maintaining a, a studio, that's the kind of attitude you need from everybody. At this at this stage, are you are you more focused on trying like to develop five or six uh, different ideas, or is it better to kind of focus on maybe like two and get them looking really polished? Because as as an art as a concept artist, I don't know if if you want to how how far you how far do you go in, in a design before you decide okay maybe I should try something else too just to kind of give some variety. Yeah, like when when doing concepts for client work and stuff. Um, I'll keep it really, really just relaxed in the beginning and sketch like how you saw me, you know, so I spend, I can spend, you know, 10 minutes and get like six, seven, sometimes eight different looks. And from there, I'll pick the ones that I think are working the best and then start cleaning them up. But not too much, right, because it's still, it's still a concept. Yeah, because I would have to think that, that for the person you're making it for, there's a fine line between giving them a lot of cool things to choose from and overwhelming them with too many. Yeah, that's that's definitely something um, to keep in mind. What I used to do is, like when I first started out, I wanted to make sure 
the client was happy, you know, and I impressed them so they come back and I get more work and everything. So I would pay too much, um, and not even not even talking about pay, because um, obviously I wouldn't charge them. I'd just go above and beyond and do more than what I should have. Um, that's kind of actually a bad thing. So it's because then again, like what you said, they get they can get kind of overwhelmed, especially if you get an art director who um, doesn't. Uh, how do I put it? Who who isn't a concept artist themselves? You know. Yeah. Um, sometimes they don't really know what they're looking at, and if they if are then should different designs can like what you said get overwhelming. So I limit it to five or six. That's kind of like the the golden golden number okay. when it comes to concepts. Now, my question is, should he have a tail? Do you see a tail? Oh, you want a tail? Uh, I'm not saying I want a tail. Uh, I'm saying let's see a tail. Uh, I'm, saying the, <laughs> I'm saying that is the question. Let's see. So I'm thinking a tail with, you know, a couple spikes on it, you know. Actually, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Good, good, thing good I'm here, call. Right? It's a good thing I'm here. I think that's the reason we pay you, right? Yard director, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that that meant I had a good idea. Oh, is that what that means? Yeah, whenever I had a good idea, uh, that goes off. The, the previous time was because I was thinking about soup. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can see what I'm doing here, right? Adding these stripes. Um, it's not because he's going to have a stripe. What I'm doing is finding the um, how the form is wrapping, because something I see in a lot of um, student work is the kind of like the the biggest downfall is they don't pay attention to form wrapping. Basically, just treat it like a 3D program. You know, you have uh, you have this kind of object. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, right. So you have this, and then you know you get the wireframe. Like that, you have to start seeing 2D objects like that in order to get things to, to read realistically. That's usually the biggest um, thing that that holds people's work back from kind of going to that next level is they don't have a good understanding of um, three dimensionality in their 2D. Well, we have a uh, question from Nick. <clears throat> when practicing concept art, what time frame is the best to shoot? Uh, for to produce a uh, concept or series of concepts uh, on a professional level? On a professional level? Mm -hmm. um, you usually, um, like what I said, you usually stick it, or keep it to uh, like five to six per page. And that usually, depending on how complex, because it, it's, it's very right, because you, you can be doing characters, you can be doing vehicles, weapons. And they all take a slightly slightly different amount of time depending on how detailed um, the, the particular object is. Usually a couple hours, you know, mm -hmm. hour and a half to two hours is usually how long it takes me to get um, a full page of five or six. Right. And if, if I'm doing like a really complex vehicle, for example, it can bump up to three or four. So it all depends on... Um, you know what kind subject of matter. object matter? Yeah. yeah, subject matter. All right, Nick. Thanks for the question. And again, if anybody else Thanks, has any questions, feel free to ask. I love questions. Yeah. We have about another um, eight ten minutes um, before uh, we're gonna move on to Brad. Hello. Damn, that's fast. You gotta make these long. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can tag team, you know. All right. Cool. Switch, and then he'll come in. So you got someone, you know, has got a day job, right? Doesn't like it. Wants to do something different. Wants right, to pursue Bernie. their career. Um. And uh, they want to be a concept artist, and they really want to dedicate themselves to uh, their craft and basically, you know, get a reboot 
on everything. And aside from obviously looking for their weaknesses and working on it, uh, is there any type of like uh, philosophy or theory that you have that keeps you going? It's it's all the, the mileage you put into it. Basically, is what it breaks down to. Because something I tell my students a lot, if like especially the ones that tend to not do the homework, you know, I kind of I have this picture that I I give them where it's um, if you kind of like if if you don't do the work right, you won't see any improvement, and if you don't see any improvement, you won't have any motivation to work. So it, you need to start this um, kind of like snowball effect, where take a take a, a month or a week where you're working, um, you know, eight to ten hours a day if if you can manage that. Because after a couple weeks of doing that, you'll see a dramatic improvement. And once you see that improvement, you, you're you going to feel really good about yourself. And you're going to be, basically, you're going to get hungry to get even better. And then it starts this this cycle where the more, the better you get, the better you get, the more you want to work. So mm -hmm. once you get that ball rolling, it's you never really look back. You know? And that's what happened to me with, actually, with... Uh, with dead panic, because I was in school and I wasn't, I wasn't really pushing myself to work that hard. And then once, when I met up with you, Ron, um, you be doing, you know, like 10, 12 hours a day to get all these concepts out, and that's what really sort of solidified this in my head as this is something I definitely want to do and that I can do professionally. Yeah, because I saw a huge improvement from not only in the amount of time that it took you to complete something, but the quality as well, you know, at the same time. Like, they just seem to constantly be progressing together. Like, uh, you caught up, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere in the middle and just kept on uh, kept on going. Yeah, once you get that, that snowball rolling, you know, it's it just builds on top of itself. And um, we have another question. Um, should you specialize in 2D in illustration or 3D concept art? Um, or uh, should you do both, going back and forth, or just integrate it? Hello. Jeff, are you there? We stumped him. Did I stump him? Did he crash? His screen has been kind of still. Damn you, Jeff! I might be having technical difficulties. So that question may never get answered. That question, uh, I could say, um, the more you know, the more hired, the the easier it is to get hired. So uh, there he is. He's returning again. Jeff Paul's around. But um, <laughs> I've seen people like uh, Mike Thompson who blend the two together. Um, he went, he's a fantastic uh, illustration artist and um, just artist overall. And he went over into uh, ZBrush and, um, and started having a whole lot of fun and then put the two together and used it to great effect. So um, I wouldn't say, you know, seclude yourself to one or the other, but use both together. Can y'all hear me? I got... Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. All right, there we go. So where are you, where are you at, Jeff? Where are you? What do you mean? Can you, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. Oh, okay. What do you mean where I'm at? Okay, just want to make sure. Yeah, stay here. <laughs> <laughs> <They suck. laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah, I'm here. All right, cool, cool. How much time I got? Like one minute? Uh, yeah, about a minute, minute and a half, two minutes. <laughs> you have a final thought that you'd like to um, impart uh, on the uh, 2D community? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess saturate wait I don't know 
Never mind. I was going to say something that doesn't make sense. No. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I was going to say something about, um, like, uh, saturating the field, you know, because um, if you want to do it, you're going to need to uh, pretty much start now and start kind of kicking your own ass and really putting in the time because I, I have a lot of students. I keep getting new students and they keep getting and they keep getting better. So this field is only going to get more and more competitive. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to get really, really difficult if you don't devote yourself. So if you really are serious about this, then uh, uh, take it seriously. Put in the time. Put in the work. All day. Yeah, guys, um, <clears throat> you can uh, check out more of uh, Jeff's work um, that he has more than 10 or 15 minutes to work on <laughs> uh, on our uh, on our page. And um, and uh, thank you for your time, uh, Jeff, and for letting us watch you, watch you sketch. Well, he's got to keep going, so you know, when I get done, yeah. you can go back yeah. and see where he is. Yeah. 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 All right, I'm I'm done now. I'm done now. Oh, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> so hard to it's so hard to leave it like this. Like, but I'll step away. You gotta keep going, man. Keep yeah, going. You, we're coming back over there. Yeah, we're coming back in about like thirty minutes. Bro. Oh, you want? All right, you want to keep going on there? Yeah, man. Come on, man. Uh, Do this on that note, bro. All right, all right, all right. All right. All right so uh, next we have a uh, Brad Brubman. He's the animation director of Dead Panic Studios, and um, He's an extremely impressive individual. We call him Brad uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Amazing dot com. <laughs> all the time, <laughs> actually, every day, all day. And um, I'm gonna let him take it from here. Hey, folks. Uh, this is uh, Brad McLeroy. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're all family here. Um, I'm the animation director, as Ron said. Uh, I've done stuff for uh, arena graphics for professional sports teams, and I've worked on uh, with on Universal projects with Ron. And now I just do what Ron tells me, for the most part, full time, uh, all day, every day. And the the, the goal here really is to, is to show you um, some things you can do with rigging uh, and animation with regard to, say, for example, a sculpt that you do, a concept sculpt, or whatever it might be that you do in ZBrush or some other program. Uh, and explain why it kind of makes sense. This is basically a sculpt, uh, just a sculpt that Ron uh, did in ZBrush and the armor uh, done by Jerry Perkins, also of DPS. Um, the color of the armor, by the way, that's just a flat color I put on there. So you know, Jerry has his own texture magic going on behind the scenes. But for the sake of this demonstration, I don't have those textures. So just so you know. Um, but let's say, for example, you made this sculpt and you took some good pictures of it. You took a render of it, and it looks really cool. He's got his mouth open and so forth. But no matter what you do, it's going to look like this from any angle. It's the exact same sculpt. Um, and the problem with, with, say, using Transpose Master or something along those lines in ZBrush is everyone who's used that, I'm sure, knows that it's a bit of a laborious process to get something posed in ZBrush using that. You have to mask out certain things and hope that the, 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 the mask is soft enough that you get a good deformation and you might bend some things, have to fix some things, and so on and so forth. And it's such a big process that by the time you've posed it, you're pretty much done. Like You're not going to try something else because you've already bent and moved it around and you're, you're, you're kind of stuck with what you got. And if you had a character like this with organic and inorganic stuff mixed together, that is almost impossible. You're going to get some bends and stuff that you don't want. So the logic behind bringing it into a program like Maya, for example, and giving it a rig is that it gives you this kind of flexibility to create a rig that you can just move around and try different things without all that time. There's an initial time uh, expense, of course, for the rig. But after that, you can just play around and come up with different poses and, if you're adventurous, animate a little bit. So here's just a basic static version of this guy, but if we were to bring in the same guy and give him some animation, we can have him kind of raise his head up, blink his eyes a little bit, even flutter his teeth if he's so inclined, and then you know get a nice little movement in the eyes and in the face, and you can kind of we can see him actually turn and move and growl and show all kinds of cool stuff going on here. And this, again, on one hand, it gives you the, the ability to animate, but on the other hand, it gives you a chance to try different poses really quickly. So, you know, the idea here is to create a rig where you can just grab controls if you want, change the pose, move them all over the place, and not have to worry about the 
20, 30 minutes it will take to get it there, and then the other hour it would take to kind of fix all the deformations that happened along the way. You can just try it. If you don't like it, you know, you can go back to it. Um, obviously, in ZBrush, you can do morph targets and layers and such, but again, those are static things. They can't change once you've done them for the most without a lot of work. So um, the idea here is just to find a way to come up with a rig or some little structure that you can use as a quick way to give yourself flexibility in the pose. So this is just an animated character here. Um, and this is obviously kind of a unique character. He's not a typical bust that you would probably have because he's got a, a somewhat inhuman proportion with his neck coming forward a little bit here, and, uh, and his jaws are obviously not necessarily human. But for the most part, even if you bring in something that's a basic little character, like a, a bust like this um, within Maya, it's a really simple process to go about giving yourself the controls needed to make this guy posable and you know easily posable. Um, so I'm just going to take you through the process really fast of creating a simple, basically a three-bone rig. There are more than three bones, but only three bones that we move to make this guy posable. All right, so if I come in here to Maya, and again, this works for any 3D program, obviously. I'm going go to my side view and go to my joint tool, and I can go to my animation module so I can access that joint tool. And I can just click here. I'm going to make sure joints are visible so you can see them. I'm going to click here for, say, the base joint for the chest, okay? And I'm going to figure out where the best bone, best place for the head, for the neck bone will be. And it's going to be right about here. I have to wait for Maya to auto save because it shows the best time possible to do that. There we go. And let's just do this again because Maya is auto saving. So neck bone, and maybe the head bone, say right here at the base of the neck, and boom. And just like that, you have yourself basically a chest, a neck, and a head bone. This little bone at the end here is just there to kind of keep the orientation of the previous bone in line with the rest of them. We won't get into that. Um, obviously, if you had a, a, an open mouth, you could simply do another jaw bone set up there uh, and grab this bone here. Make sure I can grab bones. Let's just select the head bone and hit P to parent it, but since we don't have a jaw, we don't need to. But just like that, you have these three bones set up here, and I can just grab these three bones, Let's just select the head in this case, and do what's called a smooth bind. And this will give me the, the, the ability to grab, say, the, the neck bone and just move it around, and you'll see that neck will move around with it. Okay, the eyes, of course, we can simply parent to the head bone as well, along with the hair. And pretty much just like that, you have yourself the ability, at least, to move this head around. Now, you're going to see one of the things that happens with rigging is that the distribution of, of, of points is a little bit goofy. Um, he's got a pretty interesting looking smushy face going on here. I don't see what's what you're referring to. It looks yeah, good. you know, it, 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 you, have to have a, you have to have a keen eye to oh, yeah. see that. Um, <laughs> But you know, one of the things that most of these programs have is the ability simply to what's called to do what's called painting weights, which is finding, you know, basically determining on your own which points are going to be affected by which uh, bones. Um, so if I just were to grab this head, for example, and go to my skin edit smooth skin paint weights tool, you'll see I have over here a list of the three joints uh, available to me. Joint four being the head and the whiter that object is, the more influence that bone has. So if I were to choose to replace the influence of this joint with a value of one, which is 100%, I could then paint very quickly over this whole head here and make sure that this entire head is being controlled by the head bone 100%. And it's really that simple. And just like so, we can have, we can have pretty much the whole, head, the whole head controlled by the head bone. I could also simply choose to place with one and choose flood to make the whole darn thing controlled by the head bone and then just kind of um, interactively decide, well, maybe I want just the neck from the neck down to be 100% by the neck bone and pretty quickly I can kind of knock that out. So once you do something like this, you can kind of get the rest of the uh, guy looking the way you want him to. Um, I'm just going to really quickly do a faster version of this, which is you can go point by point. I can grab all the vertices, for example, below the neck and make those using the component editor here. I can choose the joints that are available to me. And in this case, I want to find joint two, which was the, um, the chest joint. I can just grab all that, type in 100%, and therefore all these guys down here are being 100% controlled by the chest joint. And really, pretty quickly, probably, anyway, should work for me. I can move just the head around. So here's the head moving around like he's like he owns the place. And the neck bone doing his thing. And pretty quickly, you have the ability to pose your character however you want, right? A few little tweaks there and there, and, uh, here and there, and you're good to go. Not always that easy, though. And, of course, we have our 
our main character here um, set up with his controls and I want to turn off the joints. As you can see here, there are a crap load of joints on this guy. Uh, and most of those joints are for the teeth. Um, and that's because for some reason I got it in my head that I wanted the teeth to be independently animatable. That's not typical. Um, <laughs> but as you can see, I, ha I don't know why. I just think the idea of these teeth moving is cool. I don't, I don't, don't ask me why. Um, as an explanation as to what's going on with this guy, though, I want to show you some of the things you can do with this rig, and with any rig, and, I'm gonna, I, I, and our gum road is going to show you all the processes that are used to make this happen. But this head control here, for example, yes, it can move the head around, which is nice, but it also um, can make him blink. So we have here the ability to make this guy, you know, blink his eyes. Um, so if you're doing animation, or if you just want to kind of have, you know, a different look, you can knock that out. We also have the ability here to make the teeth, for example, splay out or come or wrinkle or do whatever you want to do there. We can, we can just kind of like curl in or curl out. We can make them do their little wavy thing. Uh, and we have a lot of kind of options here, for example, for the tongue. Now, what's going on with the tongue here? Well, I can make the tongue kind of wave around like so, which is kind of neat. Um, and these are all just different kinds of, of options you can create using your using your rigging techniques that we look at in the Gumroad tutorial. And I want to show you a really quick example of how this works. Let's say that this is my face here. Yeah? Yeah? You see that, Ron? You see the I face? See that. I see. This is my face. And this is pretty much how a face that I would sculpt uh, would look. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> uh, you can't tell, but it used to be a square. No, I'm kidding. Um, oh. But, Oh, this so, is <laughs> now, if you've used ZBrush before, for example, you can have an, al an alternate sculpt for your face. You can bring as a blend chip. Say you brought in, you took that face in the ZBrush, and you sculpted a smile on it. And let's say this is that alternate shape. Well, right. you can bring these, this alternate shape in and plug it into your original face and give yourself the ability to shift between a neutral face, for example, and a smile. And I've done that. Um, I'm going to grab this guy. Let's say this is, this is the exact same sphere. I just took some edges and moved them around, so it's the exact same topology. I can grab this sphere and plug it into the original by shifting by shift selecting the original guy, going out here to create deformer's blend shape, and the blend shape is like a move target in ZBrush. Uh, I can go to my option box. If this is bound to a joint, you want to make sure that this is set to front of chain. Why? Because otherwise it will override the joint's influence and won't be mid. So I'm just going to call this sphere shape, right? So I can hit create, and now of course if I grab this circle, you'll see here under the inputs, I have this sphere shape input. And right now this polysphere 3, which is this guy, is as an input. And if I go from 0 to 1, it'll simply morph from, you know, from one shape to the other. And that's, and that's fine. You have the ability to do that. You can, you, know, you, can, you know, give yourself a number of these expressions, um, frown, smile, and so forth. The one drawback with that really is that these are static. I mean, you know, no matter what I do, this, is, this one's plugged in basically as that shape. So I'm only going to go from 0 to 1, and I have to turn turn this blend shape on and off whenever I want it to come on. But if you want to kind of give your rig some more interactive changes, um, you can plug in blend shapes and have the blend shape be live the entire time and give yourself control over the blend shape itself. And I want to show you an example. Let's say, for example, I want this sphere to be able to squash and stretch, to be able to get longer and thinner or fatter and shorter. I can I, instead of actually trying to do, to do something to this actual sphere right here, you don't want to do that because the thing that's rigged to a bone has inputs controlling it already, and you don't want to have things trying to compete for influence over over this mesh. So if I grab this guy, which is the exact same copy of this, I'm just going to plug that in as well. Okay, and now I'm not going to make a new blend shape because you already have this sphere shapes deformer plugged in. So I'm going to grab this guy and let him join the party. I'm going to edit deformers blend shape add. And I can add this to that same blend shape group, which is way down here, sphere shape. So now if I grab this guy, you'll see under here I have polysphere 3 and polysphere 4 plugged in. If I turn this one on, nothing happens. Why? Because this is the exact same thing, right? So basically, this is, but this is live. If I grab these vertices and move them around, you'll see the original guy is going to update. So what I can do now is do some, have, is set, for example, a control or a deformer on this and have that just be plugged into this and I can alter this deformer whenever I want. Say, if I want this to squash and stretch, I'll go up to create deformers on my blend shape guy and go to squash. And what I'm going to see here is this little weird deformer guy plugged in. And when I grab that deformer and come in here and change what's called the factor, you'll see it's going to squash and stretch. And because it's happening to the blend shape, it's also plugged into the original, right? 
So what's the point of all this? Well, I can create a controller over here that can kind of remotely control that. So I don't even need to look at this crap over here. I can just focus on the actual animated mesh and update that on the fly. So I'm going to show you how to do that really quickly. Now, let's go. I'm going to bring back joints so I can see. This guy is skinned this one little joint here, okay? And I want this joint to be controlled by this control. So I'm going to grab this control, shift select the joint, and go to constraint, and constraint, which is going to constrain its position in space. And I also want to do an orient constraint so I can constrain its rotation. So now, if I grab this curve and move it around, it'll move the joint around, which in turn will move the sphere. But I want to be able to control the squash and stretch as well. So typically in rigging, you want to give yourself another control curve. You can just grab it and move it around and see this thing change. Because otherwise, I have to come over here and grab this little deformer guy, go to my squash, and go to factor and mess around with that. That's a real pain to try and do. So with a little initial investment in time, you can make this work for you pretty quickly. I can create another little curve. And the reason we use curves, I just had a crash. That's fantastic. You see that crash? It's no, I didn't see anything. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's a little camera shy, mm. um, but luckily for us, I already have this saved, so you get to see the joys of, of rigging. Okay. Yeah, it's just all kinds of stuff going on here. So how are you, Ron? You're good? I'm doing good. We have a question for you. Cool, man. Um, are there any books that you would recommend that have uh, good information to help improve your work or any art books that you find good for inspiration? Uh, if you want to animate, then you there there are two books you definitely want to get. One is the Animator Survival Kit, which is um, written by Richard Williams, and it's absolutely essential. And the other one would be the Illusion of Life, um, that's written by the Nine Old Men from Disney. You may have heard of those guys. Um, the Nine. The Nine. Yeah, the Nine. Um, <laughs> But you know, in, in, in terms of animation, especially, you know, the key is going to be reference, and that's the same thing for sculpture. I'm sure. Um, if you want to animate well, you need to basically look at uh, the way things look in the real world, right? And have to you know, have to kind of replicate that. Same thing with sculpture. You have to know anatomy, or you're not going to be good at sculpting. Um, in animation, though, I think it's, it's it's just as important, if not more important, because the one thing that we've all done, we all know what it looks like when people walk. We all know what it looks like when they when they talk and so forth. And um, if you don't get that right, it looks really weird. Right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, nothing. That, that, you know, you you can get away with with with, with bad sculptures sometimes. I know I have, <laughs> um, mostly because oh, yeah. you have you have the luxury basically of saying, well, it's stylized. Right. <laughs> but you know, but but. Physics is physics, you know. No matter whether it's stylized motion or not, we still know what walks feel like, and we know, you know what what hawking looks like. Um, and if you if you don't really take into consideration all the little details that make us do what we do, um, it's not going to look good. So as far as books go, you know, that, those those are those are good books as reminders. But I hate to say this, and this is this is going to sound like a cop out, but the best thing to do is to observe because. That's the only way. I mean, the, that's, it was really hard about animating to me, anyway. And I'm talking while I'm doing this, so I apologize if I stutter around here. But what's, what's, what's hard about animation is that so much of what we do, we do without thinking. You know, like you know, the things that you do when you're nervous or something like that, you do that without thinking, um, or when you're thinking to yourself. You know, what do you look right. like when you're thinking? And what animators have to do is think about the things you don't think about. Which is, you know, it's it's a bit it's a bit tough because the whole point of that is that we do subconscious things, and even though they're subconscious, we consciously notice when they're not there, as viewers, um, and that's what animation is. It makes it so tough is that all those little details that we take for granted are the things that make people look alive. Right. Which is why a lot of times you get that uncanny valley thing because yeah, it looks like that a person, but it doesn't look like a person. So to get back to what I was saying, hopefully that helped. Hopefully that was that was helpful. Um, but yeah, like again, also the, the 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 best thing for animation, especially, is is practice rigging. Um, there are there are some there are some good books. There's actually a, a tutorial series called The Art of Rigging, which is a book as well. It's like a PDF. It's giant, but it's very 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 helpful. Um, Stop staring is a good facial rig and animation book. <laughs> is um, it called Stop Staring? <laughs> Stop staring. Yeah, it's a great great book. That's great. Um, but for, yeah, and, and but rigging, you know, so many things change uh, in terms of what people are doing. There's so, there's so much great innovation out there. The web is your best friend in that regard. Um, and to get back, so let's say for example, to get back before I had that wonderful crash, wasn't that fun for everybody? Um, 
let's say I want to interactively uh, make this squash and stretch thing work. Well, I know that the thing that's making this thing squash and stretch is this thing called the factor. If I change this factor up and down, I can make this squash and stretch, right? So let's make that something I can, anim I can uh, animate remotely. I just created this little NURB circle. This is going to be my NURBs, this is going to be my squash and stretch control. So I'm just going to name this. One of the things, by the way, if you are going to do rigging, no matter what, no matter how serious or, or casual it is, naming is, is very, very important. So it's very easy to get confused because, you know, joint three does not really tell you anything. Um, so I have this little control here. It's just a circle, and I've frozen my transformations, which means I've zeroed out all of its controls and made this its new default position. I can do, in, in Maya, it's really very easy. I can go to what's called the connection editor under window, general editors, and I can connect the outputs of one object to the uh, outputs of something else. So I can say, for example, the translate Y up and down of this circle can be plugged into the, let me grab this little deformer here, the factor of the squash. So whenever this moves up, this factor will go up. When it moves down, the factor will go down. So if I grab this little squash input here and load this into the right of my connection editor, all I got to do is click on translate Y on the left and factor on the left, on the right. Now if I grab the circle and move it up and down, you'll see it's going to actually just change the factor of the squash, uh, the squash deformer, which will then deform the blend shape, which in turn deforms, you know, this guy, right? Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but the, the ability to kind of remotely and interactively change your mesh is a lot cooler, I think, than just having a single shape plugged in because you never know. Maybe you'll like it a different way. Uh, and one of the great things about rigging in general is that it gives you, like, like Jeff was saying before about happy accidents, it gives you the possibility to find something you didn't realize was there just by virtue of trying, you know, seeing the in-betweens of what you had already made. And the, uh, the wretch... This guy here, as you can see, he's got some control curves. I'm just going to hide these joints for a moment. Um, but under the wretch node, we have a number of blend shapes that are plugged into this guy, as you can see. <laughs> and all these blend shapes are variations, and most of them are live. So, for example, this guy over here, if you look closely here, I have some joints that I put on this guy. Here are some joints right there, as you can see. Oops, I, probably, I just deleted it. Didn't mean to do that. Um, these are joints right here, and these joints deform this mesh. And this mesh is plugged into this guy. So when I grab, for example, let me show you some of these controls here. Yeah, my joint visibility, there they are. When I grab this curve, for example, let me see if I can grab the curve, and move it, this curve will move that joint. And since that joint moves this mesh, and that mesh is plugged into here, I get, you see, you see? You see? And again, very quickly, I can just say, okay, I want this up a little bit, I want this down a little bit, and I can kind of mess around with the way these things look um, interactively instead of saying, well, I have a smile that I can just plug in. You know, you don't necessarily want exactly the same expression. You might find that mixing this or that with some other poses will kind of get the job done. Now, some of this other stuff we'll talk about later, but just, just a side note, it's very important that you can make a drool. It's very important. I can't stress enough how important it is that there's drool involved in in any any sculpture. Yes. You know. Anything with a long tongue deserves drool. When it deserves drool. The long the long tongue needs to be able to undulate. Um, you know th that's just common sense. Uh, but uh, yeah. So. Uh, one of the best things about rigging in general is the fact that it gives you that flexibility. And I've been babbling for a long time. I kind of want to see where Jeff is right now. I'm sure everyone probably wants to see what Jeff is. In any case, yeah, so the, uh, the animation on this guy is going to be part of uh, the finished product here. Um, and it gives you the ability to kind of, again, noth nothing's more, nothing's cooler than seeing something you've made come alive, you know, almost literally. And thank goodness it's not literally because we'd all be dead. But, um, it's nice to see it be able to move and give the impression that, you know, I mean, when you sculpt something, for example, your goal is, I imagine, to make it look like it's alive. Um, and Absolutely. nothing's better, nothing's more, um, what's that word, nothing's more convincing of something being alive than it actually moving. Uh, and that's what, you know, even if it's just a subtle little thing, it's a big, it's a, it's a big, it's, it's, a, it's a big benefit to be able to have that, uh, that capacity to just, you know, to make something come a lot, make something move around a little bit, even yeah, if it's subtle. Like, uh, even even to us, like a turntable is like, oh wow, look at that, because <laughs> <laughs> it's just spinning in place. We're Especially, yeah, you're, you're, you're not used to seeing it. Sometimes you're not used yeah. to seeing your stuff move. Static. So yeah. you know, when you see it finally move, you're like, oh my god, I can do that. I forgot about this. You know, 
you're so used to looking at the, the silhouette and the form when you're sculpting it, but um, seeing it actually be able to be, you know, put into motion, uh, just as that's a nice little finishing touch. And plus, you know, a turntable is nice, but you know, a walk cycle's nicer. <laughs> oh, wave. <laughs> Looking right through the uh, the animation. I sure can. Let me uh, let me quickly close this because this scene file seems to be angry with me. So yes, the actual animation here, uh, and that's another thing about about doing this, of course, is that you're not just animating the character, but you can animate the camera as well. So you have, you know, if you've used ZBrush and you've played around with your camera settings and your perspective to kind of make it feel, you know, a little bit more stylized, a little bit more intimidating. The same thing applies in a program like Maya, except, of course, you can also animate the camera a lot more easily. Anyone's ever tried to animate the camera in ZBrush? <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Not necessarily the easiest thing to do. Well, um, that could just be me talking, but, uh, yeah, um, no, it's not, it's not just me talking. So, for example, here we have, let me turn off my curves so we can see this. So the idea in this little animation here is that we're kind of seeing him in his, it's like almost hibernating or slumbering here as we move around. Uh, and if you look close, you'll see his, he occasionally squints his eyes because, you know, I'm, I'm imagining he's dreaming probably about chasing rabbits. Right. And, um, then he finally opens his eyes. And if you look closely here, his little teeth flutter, just kind of like a, you know, it's kind of like stretching, you know, when you wake up in the morning. Right. You know, so and you have a nice little, his eyes, his eyes open here. He kind of cuts, he, starts, he realizes where he is now. And then he sees this nosy cameraman. In the area. <laughs> you know, he's basically saying, you know, wait, this guy. Right. And of course, he's got to say, what are you doing here? Get off my lawn. I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. and I, yeah. Nice. And, you know, that's, um, and again, maybe it, it must be. I was uh, rendering out this 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 very this very animation using V-Ray, and I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but V-Ray tends to be a little bit selfish when it comes to your resources. Um, a little. Just and uh, it 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 does fine work, but it's uh it, it's really kind of a, a hog. So the fact that I had a little bit of a crash there, I'm not going to blame Maya for this. I'm going to blame V-Ray, even though I love it. I do. We've been through a lot together, <laughs> but uh, the one last thing I want to show you before we uh, before I, I shut up here is one of the things that using these kinds of these kinds of controls that I showed and we do together in the Gumroad is well, there's nothing because I just got another crash, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it's because I'm set to high quality. I think my graphics card is a little bit uh, touchy right now. But that's okay. We're staring at him right now. You can see how, gl how glorious he is. Man, mm. talk about stage fright. My computer is just... Uh, <clears throat> What's going on, man? I don't know. I don't know. It's never what happened. You know, yeah, they say it happens to a lot of guys. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't think that's true. Well, um, well you're, uh, we'll leave you off on this question then. Uh, when, uh, when posing a full character with Zebra... Um, ZBrush Transpose Master versus uh, Maya Smooth Binding uh, Rig uh, pose any difference in time, or is there uh, just a major difference in style? Um, There's a dramatic difference in time, largely because when you're posing a character in, say, my and say Maya, you know, the, the biggest challenge I think to get a good pose is to make it feel like the weight's distributed well, and the problem that you have in ZBrush using Transpose Master is you don't have IK. You can't just grab the root and push it down and have the legs, you know, stay still. So you almost have to kind of, almost have to like think reverse. You know, like I have to move the legs up so that they're bent, so it feels like he's squatting down. And that to me is a lot. It's a lot less intuitive. And again, generally speaking, right. when you, you know, if you're trying to to get a good looking pose. It's really tough to try and get a, a good feel for how the center of gravity is going to basically work with the feet when you have to work backwards from the feet up. You know, like it's that, I find that really dis, like really difficult to do. It's so much easier just to grab the the, the root control of a of a of a bound character um, and just push it down. You know, and then and go from there. And I'll show you the quickest of examples here, if I if I may. Um, 
let's say we have a character like, oh, I don't know, Lobo. Um, Ooh. I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy. I've but, never heard of him. Yeah. Who is he? He's, he's just some dude. You know. No, okay, no worries then. Um, <laughs> but if I wanted to pose this guy and give him a good like action pose, then I could I could just go to five here so I can see this better. Um, I can simply grab the root control, you know, and get push him down right away. I'm just going to turn off the uh, sim layer so the coast not in the way. I can push him down. I can kind of figure out exactly how you know much of a squat position I want him to be in, and and just kind of adjust the feet. Afterward, but if you're if you're working in Transpose Master, um, you're kind of stuck with okay, where would I put the feet if he's like in this pose? And I, now you know, I have the feet where I want. Now I can say okay, now I want to lean him back a little bit here and so forth. And if you're doing this in Transpose Master, you can't do that because the feet are going to fly around with him. And that's just it. It's I find that anyway really difficult to get a good dynamic pose that way. What I end up having to do in ZBrush is basically bring in like a mannequin. Um, you know, from from Maya or some other you know some other rate character that I posed already, and then try and match that pose using Transpose Master by you know masking off the the reference mesh and you know it's it's, it's just a whole ordeal. Whereas here, you know, I can just pose him, and then you know, and I'm done. And, or you know, you can always bring it back into Maya for some tweaks if you need to. But for the most part, being able to to pose something quickly. Um, is much or more freeing. Facial expressions, just forget about it, man. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and again, and it's destructive too, right? I mean, once you once you start making these changes, you're kind of stuck with those changes. If you know, if in if you want to try and adjust them a little bit, you have to kind of undo all the stuff that you've already done. Whereas if it's rigged, you're just moving controls around. And if you want to go back to where it was, you just zero out the control. You know, it's not. It's 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 so much easier. And you know, the same thing about what what makes ZBrush so great to sculpt in is that you can try things out really quickly. You know, you can grab the Move brush and say, let's try changing the entire nose. If you're modeling that in something like Maya by pushing points around, you're not going to take. You're not going to try that because it's ridiculously large investment in time for possibly no payoff whatsoever. You know, and the same thing applies to rigging. You can, you, you know, you, you won't experiment nearly as much with Transpose Master as you will with the rig because you know going in how much of a time commitment it would be to do that. Right, and all the resculpting and all that stuff. Yeah. That's why we were talking before about, you know, typically when I post, this, when I post something in Transpose Master, I'm like, that's it, I'm done. You know, <laughs> I might tweak it a little bit, but this is this is the road I'm going down no matter what because you have no choice. You know, you can't really undo the damage done by the pose without, you know, Having to basically start all over again. That's that's kind of the idea here. So again, I can take this mesh right back in the in the ZBrush, do some tweaking if I need to. If I don't like it, I can say, you know what? Okay, I'm just gonna stand up again, just like that. And instead of having to try and figure out, just doing this. Think about having to do this with Transpose Master. How, you, know, you have to you have to change the orientation of the thigh and the knee, you know, and then try and figure out how to keep the legs. No, no, forget that. Mm -mm. Screw that, Ron. Screw that. No. I can make him say, screw that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we'll leave it on that. Yeah. That's <laughs> Thanks, Ron. <laughs> yeah, great work as always, Ben. Great work. I like to say that I, I went uh, five minutes without, without a crash, so <clears throat> that's my own, you know. Yeah. Things are looking up. Things are looking good, man. That memory you bought was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do we got over here, Jeff? What do we got over here? I was just sketching around. So this is the original. I thought maybe I wanted to do something with these like tiny little spikes in the background. I thought maybe it'd be cool if you had some some something extra, you know, so mess around with first of all, just two different types of shapes dramatically different like this one, you know, like really sharp, angular, tall, thin, That's and then cool. something more like this, like Heavy, more like tank feeling, you know. And then we're th what we were talking about too earlier about like his organs are stored. So maybe like he carries them on his back, like extra organs or I don't know something like that. So um, um, Pierre's sketch zombie Roger had this awesome sketch, and I told him I was going to steal it. So let's do that. All right, uh, <laughs> we'll put some skulls in the tanks, man. Just have them floating around. <laughs> <laughs> Skulls, on it. Skulls in the tanks, man. Just fucking floating around and goo. 
you can never be too prepared when it comes to bringing uh, extra organs. It's yeah. just a, a good rule of thumb for you know for everyone out there. From experience, you want to have an extra intestine. Something. And actually, I have gooey organ brushes if I can find them. Because I made them just for this guy. Oh yeah, nice. Damn it, I don't know where they are. Gooey organs. Did you say gooey <laughs> organs? Yeah, like I googled up like I don't even know what I googled up, but there's lots of, like, you know, when you get that that shine, lots of that the lights. Oh it's, yeah. Like, really slimy. I have those somewhere, so I could slap those on too. You know. <laughs> I like the spiky wings. I like the spiky wings. There you go. <laughs> there, you got some skulls. There you go. Stole it. Stolen, Pierre. That's what Bam. you get. That's what you get. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Brad, for uh, for taking your time. And um, hopefully, this was uh, helpful to everyone else that was watching. And uh, we should be back next month with a couple more guests and um, and some more awesome knowledge for all of you. And uh, thank you again. And everybody, say bye, YouTube. Bye, bye YouTube. YouTube. Thank you.